from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello, my name is Alyssa Carroll, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. Special thanks to some of my patrons, Pixie, Rachel, Whitney, Maya, Alethea, Elena, Aaron, Katoras, Catherine, Sam, Linda, Katarina, Teresa, Sophie, Nanette, Emma, Emily, Galen, Bree, David, John, and Judy. Thank you so much, guys. You are truly appreciated. And for anyone else, please feel free to join my patrons so that I can bring you more of what you crave. Also, like, share, and subscribe. It might just help our community grow. Now, I can hear the groans of disappointment already as you see who this podcast is about. Charles Manson has been done over and over by absolutely everyone in this community. And I get it. I never intended on covering him because we know just about everything we ever will about him. There are YouTubers out there that have done multi-episode videos on him and his story. I think we have retraced his steps as much as humanly possible. But then again, as I've said many times before, there is a whole generation behind us that is just getting old enough to find their interest in true crime. and. I feel this is perfect timing to educate them so we don't have to see any more memes with Charles Manson grouped in with serial killers. He was not a serial killer by any stretch of the imagination. But for those members of the murder fam who know me, they are already rubbing their little hands together in excitement because they know I'm going to work my magic and make the old stories about him new. So if you are old hat, as they say, then sit back, relax, enjoy the familiar story. And for those not so familiar with Manson, buckle in. This is quite the bumpy ride. Now I'm lumping him in my playlist of cults and cult leaders because when you get down to brass taxes, that's what he basically was. Okay, let's begin. Charles Miles or Mills Manson was born on November 12, 1934 in Cincinnati, Ohio. So as we always do, let's get into some history for that time. In 1934, we finally see the unemployment rate down at 22% as the Great Depression was beginning to release its grip on the world, but make no mistake, the world's economy was still at rock bottom. We saw a rise in political extremism all around, Nazism, fascism, and extreme communism. And in one very critical country, Germany, Hitler had now declared himself the Führer or ultimate ruler. Stalin had begun his massacres, and in China, communist doctrine was spreading like wildfire. The drought that was already nearly ruining the Midwest in the United States, known as the Dust Bowl, had destroyed around 35 million acres of farmland and hundreds more were at risk. Some famous criminals who were active in 1934 were John Dillinger, Bonnie and Clyde, Pretty Boy Floyd, and Babyface Nelson. In Scotland, it was said that Nessie, or the Loch Ness Monster, was seen for the first time, which brought with it the famous surgeon's photograph of her. Now, of course there were sightings long before this, but now we had a photo. 
In Japan, their government announced it would no longer be honoring the agreements in the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, as well as the London Navy Treaty of 1930. This move was made in order for Japan to be able to grow its navy as it entered into conflicts in the Pacific and the country began an aggressive military expansion campaign just before World War II. The Philippine Independence Act was enacted this year as well. The law established the Commonwealth of the Philippines and created a framework of full independence from the U.S. and introduced a 10-year transition period. They were fully independent in 1946. In Australia, the McRobertson Air Race occurred. It was held as a way to commemorate Melbourne and Australia's victorious state. A total of 20 participants joined the race from England and Australia. In India, an 8.0 magnitude earthquake hit in Nepal, roughly six miles south of Mount Everest, and it shook the Himalayas, taking the lives of around 10,000 people. This was one of the worst earthquakes in India's history. A curious phenomenon of this earthquake was that sand and water vents began to appear throughout the central vents of the earthquake area. Extensive soil saturation meant that several structures just seemed to float away. In the Middle East, the Yemen government and the British representative made a treaty of friendship, if you will, which resolved some of the disputes between them over the border between Yemen and the Aden Protectorate. The British guaranteed the independence of Yemen for the next 40 years, but then King Ibn Saud ordered the Crown Prince of Arabia to reoccupy townships in the highlands of Tayama after the Ayman of the Yemen had seized. He stated that he tried all diplomatic means of seeking an agreement, but the Ayman had persisted in a policy of oppressing the inhabitants and eradicating all who would not surrender. And in Ohio, the summer of 1934 was ranked as the hottest in Ohio since temperature records began in 1883. Warm and dry weather was the trademark of this year in Ohio, as well as much of the U.S. in general. The hottest day was on July 21st, where the temperature in Columbus was 106 degrees Fahrenheit, or 41 degrees Celsius. It was 109 in Cincinnati, where Manson was born, and 111 degrees in Wilmington and Hamilton, so this was the atmosphere that Charles was born into. His parents were Colonel Walker Henderson Scott and Kathleen Maddox. Colonel Walker was born in 1910 in Pike County, Kentucky, nearly on the borders of West Virginia and Virginia. This area is still mostly wild and beautiful, huge rolling forested hills. His parents were Henderson and Gladys Scott, now, Charlie's paternal side were firmly from the same general area for generations before him, but his paternal great-great-great-great-grandfather, Peter Klein, had been born in Germany in 1756 and died in 1841 in West Virginia. He immigrated here young, joined the American military during our country's war for independence. Then he married his wife, Lizzie, in 1786 in Virginia when he was 30. Now Peter, the, the oldest ancestor I could find for Charles Manson, settled on a rather large chunk of land that bordered Tug Fork, which is a smaller river coming off of the Big Sandy River, and that river is the state line between West Virginia, Virginia, and Eastern Kentucky. So it would appear that Charlie's ancestors didn't really venture off and away from that exact area for many generations. Now Peter's son Jacob was described as a rather wealthy man and owned several thousand acres, which would of course be part of, if not all, of the land Peter had. 
Jacob had served in a Virginia unit during the War of 1812, and it was also stated that Jacob owned slaves. There was some controversy over the ownership of some of that land that Jacob left to his youngest son, Perry. Well, that led to a huge blowout of the already heated feud between the, get this, Hatfields and the McCoys, which is a very famous war between the two families. You see, Perry's next door neighbor was none other than Devil Ants Hatfield himself, the leader of the Hatfield clan. Devil began trespassing on Perry's land and cutting down valuable timber. But again, there's so much more there. It could be a podcast all on its own. Just let me know. But Perry isn't the lineage that we're following. His older brother and Jacob's second son, Peter, is who the next in Charlie's lineage is, his great-great-grandfather. Peter grew up and married the youngest McCoy girl, Elizabeth. So you see, Charlie had a tiny bit of that McCoy blood flowing through his veins. In fact, one of Elizabeth's older sisters married one of Peter's brothers as well. So Peter and Elizabeth had three known children. Their youngest was Colonel Calvin Klein, born in 1865. This is Charlie's great grandfather. Colonel Calvin and his wife had seven children, the oldest being Gladys, born in 1886. She married a man by the name of Henderson Walker Scott, and now we see Charlie's closer relatives have moved just across the river from all of that land previously that the Kleins owned and into Kentucky. Gladys and Henderson were Charlie's paternal grandparents. They married in August 1904 and had four children, two boys, two girls. Their youngest son, Colonel Walker Henderson Scott, is allegedly Charlie's biological father. So that is his ancestry on his father's side. They were mostly wealthy landowners, the first generation to land here from Germany. And now, on to his mother. Ada Kathleen Maddox was born in either 1918 or 1919, depending on the source, around Moorhead, Kentucky, not too far northeast of where all those generations on Charlie's paternal side were. Going back through Kathleen's father's ancestry, the furthest back I could go was a man named Abraham Maddox, born in 1797 in an area of Kentucky just west of Charlie's paternal side. And while I couldn't really find anything out about Abraham, it is stated that there was no body to bury because it had been, quote, lost or destroyed. But he had been married a couple of times and died in 1860. His fourth child, a son named Cyrus Grimes Maddox, love that name, was born in 1827 in the eastern part of Kentucky over there with the rest. Cyrus also married a couple of times, and though there was no information on this, his first wife died the same year their son Christopher Maddox was born in 1856, which leads me to believe she perhaps died in childbirth, but don't hold me to that. Of course, we know that this was not an uncommon occurrence back then. Christopher would have been Charlie's great-grandfather. Christopher married a woman named Sarah in 1875, and they had what appears to be only one child together, Kathleen's father, Charles Miles Maddox, born in 1884. Christopher did go on to marry his wife's first cousin after. Scandalous. So, Charles as I will refer to Charlie's grandfather to save on confusion, grew up, fought in World War I, and worked as a conductor for the B&O Railroad. He married a girl named Nancy Ingram in 1907. They went on to have four children, three girls and one boy. The last child born was Kathleen. Now I'm sure that you've heard all manner of things about Charlie's mother. Charlie himself said a lot about her, but a considerable amount was just not true. 
And as I'm sure you know, I've done my very best to find out the most accurate information on her, separating fact from fiction. Sources say during her childhood, she led a comfortable, average, working class life. Her parents were apparently very religious, and especially her mother, Nazarene to be exact. Her mother believed that the Bible was to be followed word for word to be interpreted literally, which would be stifling to any child. But the overall consensus is that they both were good parents who loved their children. When Kathleen was 10 years old, the family moved to the city of Ashland, Kentucky. This is really very close to the tri-state corner of Kentucky, West Virginia, and Ohio. And then when Kathleen was 13 years old, her father died from pneumonia. He was only 48 years old. By this point, the oldest sibling, Glenna, had been married and had a daughter, but had gotten a divorce. She and her daughter came back home to live with their mother and the other siblings. Then just more than a year after Charles had died, the next child, Eileen, also died from pneumonia. Now, as we can all imagine, Nancy must have been completely heartbroken. Sources say to try to cope with the pain of losing her husband and daughter, she sort of doubled down on her religious faith and ruling over her two younger children, Luther and Kathleen. At this point, Luther was nearly 18 years old and Kathleen just 15. Both found their life quite stifling at home and their mother and the inevitable rebellious behavior began. Kathleen was close with her older brother, who was a bit of a hooligan, and she would sneak out of the house with him to go out and have a good time and dance with other boys, which to her mother's faith was nearly as sinful as pure sex. She said in a later interview, quote, I guess I had a tendency to be a little wild, the way kids will, end quote. She was taught that being a good girl meant, quote, no boys, no skirts, no fun, end quote. Good girls cooked and cleaned, were quiet and always accommodating. We all know the 1930s housewife stereotype. You must remember that back in the 30s, religious backwoods country girls were not to be seen with their hair up, wearing shorter dresses, makeup, or wearing anything that might show her bare arms. And then going out to dance? Oh. So it was during one of her scandalous outings to go dancing that she met Colonel Walker Henderson Scott, who, by the way, was never actually in the military. But he was rather known for being a bit of a con man, and he was also married to a woman named Dorothy. He was 23 years old, Kathleen just 15. He was handsome, older, bit of a sweet talker, and Kathleen fell for him nearly immediately. He bought her drinks and paid attention to her in ways she had never experienced. You can imagine what happened next. So once it was discovered that she was pregnant, she was pointed out and used as an example to her peers, the purest definition of how girls were not to behave. She told Colonel that she was pregnant and he spun her a web of lies, walked away and did not return as promised. It does appear that her mother accepted the pregnancy, though, didn't kick her out or any of that. But Kathleen realized that she had been lied to by the father of her baby. He wasn't coming back. And as she looked to the future, all she saw was a predictable, cookie-cutter existence, and she became depressed. At some point during her pregnancy, she met a man named William Manson. They married in August 1934. William was 25 and Kathleen was still 15 years old. And then Charlie was born three months later across the river in Cincinnati. Now, this is where sources vary wildly. So many sensationalized sources state that his original birth certificate showed that Kathleen named him, quote, no name Maddox and that she didn't give him a proper name for a few months. Of course, 
I had believed this to be true as well, but I searched and searched for that birth certificate and never found an official copy. The closest I found was where the only name listed for him was plainly Manson. It lists his father as William Manson, a laborer and a dry cleaner, and Kathleen, a waitress. There is another birth certificate that lists him as Charles Miles Maddox, but that's it. But I believe what has been twisted was that the one birth certificate that just says Manson, no first or middle name. Kathleen later said that she wanted to give her mother time to travel up to the hospital to help name him, and that's all. So it would appear that he was never no name Maddox. If someone has proof otherwise, I would love to see it. But regardless, Kathleen named her infant after her father, and it would seem that life might turn out okay for the young mother, her husband, and baby Charlie. Of course, we know that is simply not the case. On mansonblog.com, it is said that Kathleen and William's marriage, though they loved to go out dancing together, didn't even last five months. Early the next year, Kathleen packed her and Charlie's things and moved back in with Nancy. William would officially ask for a divorce in July 1936, not even two years after the marriage. In the divorce documents, William lists that Kathleen, quote, refused to cook any meals, do any housework, or to help keep things clean, persistently refused to perform her marital duties during the fall season of 1934, so just before Charlie was born. Cruelty for constantly nagging and berating her husband over his lack of earnings, the lack of money for dances, lack of a home of her own, uttered in the presence of others to humiliate him, end quote, because the couple lived with his mother. It is also important to note that Colonel Scott's wife, just over a year after Charlie was born, gave birth to a son, Charlie's half-brother. Then they had yet another son, but his wife divorced him when Charlie was around seven years old. Her grounds for divorcing him included abuse, non-support, and alcoholism. But just before Kathleen's divorce was final from William, she filed a paternity suit against Colonel Scott and actually won. He was ordered to pay a very meager sum of $5 a month in child support, and sources state that he even came around and saw toddler Charlie a few times before he disappeared again. And once her divorce was finalized, she left Charlie with her mother, as she often did, met up with a friend and hitchhiked across the river to go have some fun. The car they got into got into a minor accident, and the two girls lied to the police about their age. So you see, it didn't seem that Kathleen was very interested in making the life sacrifice to be the mother to her son that she should have been. She certainly didn't want to get a job to work and support her child, but rather she wanted to find a man who would do all of that for her and Charlie. In 1939, when Charlie wasn't yet five years old, a very life-weary Kathleen had moved them to McMeehan, West Virginia, as well as her mother and some other family. Then she, her brother Luther, and his future wife robbed a man and were eventually arrested for armed robbery. Kathleen was sentenced to five years in prison, Luther for 10, and Charlie went to live with Kathleen's sister, Glenna, and her family. In interviews, Charlie does talk about visiting his mother in prison in the visiting room. His aunt, uncle, and grandmother did their best to give him the most normal life they could with regular visits with his mother. He speaks of another uncle that was a mountain man, typical of Appalachia, where he was raised, telling him that the Quote, Yankee schools were no good and filling his head with information quite twisted from the complete truth as society would see it. But he was also being raised with his cousin, Glenna's daughter, who was just a few years older than him. 
She was tasked with helping him acclimate, but it was stated that she kind of knew Charlie was different. At this point, he was already a practiced and talented liar. He loved being the center of attention at all times, and if he felt he wasn't, he would act out and talk back in order to get the attention he felt he needed. But in an interview with Kathleen much later, she stated, quote, Charles had a wonderful personality. He always had a way with people. He always had charm. He was real musical and had a real nice voice, so I gave him singing lessons. But then he got so conceited about his music that I made him stop the lessons. But he still sang special solos in church, and people always talked about how good he sang. I think that made him overconfident. He never had to take a fall, not till he was a grown man." End quote. So once Kathleen was out of prison, Charlie lived with her off and on, and when he was 10, she married a drunk named Louis Cavender, and though they were ultimately married quite a few years, the marriage was tumultuous and she left him regularly. In turn, with the instability of life at home with his mother, the now 10-year-old Charlie began running away and going back to his aunt and uncles. Back and forth he went between these adults. So Charlie was already showing signs of his future self at such a tender age. He was incredibly gifted at manipulating other children to get them to do things for him. As we all know, Charlie was just a very small man, so he was also quite small compared to the other children his age. And to compensate for that, he was able to talk other children, most of the time girls, into beating up boys he didn't like. Then when the teachers would confront him about it, it was said that he would say the other kids did it of their own free will, that he had done nothing wrong. Sound familiar? His cousin said in an interview with the Daily Mail, quote, there was never anything happy about him. He never did anything good, end quote. She stated that he became obsessed with knives and guns, and when he lost control of his anger, his eyes became black with intensity that convinced her he was capable of injuring or even killing her. Quote, you could whip him all day and he'd still act however he wanted, end quote. He absolutely detested school and made a habit of skipping as often as he could. He began stealing and even told Diane Sawyer in a prison interview that he had set his school on fire. I can't verify if that's true, of course. But his behavior was becoming more and more troublesome while his mother also began drinking more and more, sleeping around with other men. From the site mansonblog.com, quote, there were articles in two Indianapolis newspapers saying that Ada Cavender and Lloyd Deere were arrested for adultery in the first week of January 1949, Ada being Kathleen's given first name. Kathleen was released on her own recognizance with assurances from a businessman that she would show up for her court date in February. Deere was also released. When the February court date rolled around, neither Kathleen or Deer were to be found. She had decamped after her arrest and left town without Charlie, leaving him to fend for himself. The reason Kathleen was arrested in the first place was because Charlie had been up to a bit of mischief, stealing, and when police went to Kathleen's looking for Charlie, she told them where he could be found. Much to her surprise, she was arrested on the adultery charge." End quote. So you see, Charlie was already on the police's radar before he was even a teenager. And Kathleen just did not have the wherewithal to deal with him, so she decided to give him over to social services when he was 12 years old. He had already been committing armed robbery and auto theft, the story you hear about her trading him for a pitcher of beer is also not true. She loved her son, but was not able to be any kind of responsible parent. Was she a prostitute, as everyone says? 
No, but she did take many lovers. She had a child when she herself was still a child and didn't seem to be able to give up her own lifestyle to parent Charlie. But hey, at least she wasn't Casey Anthony. So he was placed in the Gabald home for boys in Terre Haute, Indiana, that was run by Roman Catholic priests. Here, Charlie stated that the institution was filled with violence, intimidation, and sexual assault. Now, he was adamant that he was never assaulted, that the stories of him enduring that are completely untrue. In a jailhouse interview, though, I'm not sure who to credit for this clip, but he said this. The part about that school in Indiana, that's not true? Uh, treated... Bits and parts of it are true and bits and parts of it aren't. That you were raped, that you were beaten oh, constantly. Come on, man. That's not true. That's what he would like to believe. But so, there ain't, no, ain't nobody can do that. So you're saying that that didn't happen? No. An article written by Al Hunter for the Weekly View newspaper stated that this school was quite strict, where, quote, punishment for even the tiniest infraction, including beatings by either a wooden paddle or a leather strap, end quote. And in all honesty, we have all heard the stories that mirror this and much, much worse coming from these types of institutions. Now, I certainly hope he wasn't assaulted in his youth the way so many were in those places, but there's no way of knowing. What we do know is that in less than a week, he ran away and he slept in the woods, under bridges, or wherever he could find shelter. He then visited his mother for Christmas that year and she promptly took him back to the boy's home. Less than a year later, he ran away again this time into Indianapolis. It was here that in 1948, 14-year-old Charlie robbed a grocery store and at first he innocently was just going to steal some food because he was starving. But he happened to find a cigar box that had over a hundred dollars in it and he took it. That's more money than he had ever seen in his entire life. He used the money to get a room in a very bad part of town and, quite frankly, to eat. And then sources say he decided he might try to live an honest life. Charlie got a job with Western Union delivering messages, but it didn't take long for him to supplement his income with petty theft. Predictably, he was caught in 1949, but the judge took pity on him and sent him to yet another boys' town in Omaha, Nebraska. There was actually an article written in the Indianapolis newspaper about this. The article begins with, quote, Charles Manson, 14, a dead-end kid who has lived in an emotional blind alley most of his life, is happy today. He's going to Boys Town, end quote. In bold lettering under the fourth paragraph, it says, quote, he likes animals. The article goes on to talk about his mother and how she entertained men frequently, drank entirely too much, and wasn't at all interested in parenting her son, being left to his own devices. And so off he went. He lasted four days before escaping and this time with a friend where they somehow got their hands on a gun and a stolen car. They then committed two armed robberies, but Charlie was arrested two weeks later and sent to the Indiana Boys School, which was yet another very strict reform school. This school he would run away from a total of 18 times. And I learned to do all the things that you do in reform school. Then I went to, uh, I escaped there a bunch of times and I went to prison. This school was horrific to say the least. To try to save himself from violent sexual assaults, he played what he later called the insane game, where he would make loud, random noises and wave his arms around and oddly move his body to convince whoever the attacker might be that he was insane. Charlie again said he was never overpowered. Many sources say he was more than once, so take that as you will. 
It was during one of those escapes in 1951 when Charlie was 17. He and two other boys were robbing gas stations and stolen cars, attempting to get to California when they were caught and arrested in Utah. This time, Charlie had taken a stolen car across state lines, meaning he had committed his first official federal crime. But he was able to sweet talk his way into being sent to Washington, D.C.'s National Training School for Boys, rather than full-on prison, until he turned 21 years old. Once there, they gave him an aptitude test, which showed that he was, in fact, illiterate, meaning he couldn't really read or write well, but he had an above-average IQ of 109. Side note, I question this number, if his intelligence had to have a label on it, but it was the early 50s, so there's that. He was deemed aggressively antisocial. His psychiatrist recommended that he be transferred to a place called Natural Bridge Honor Camp, which was a minimum security institution, which is exactly what Charlie wanted. But then his Aunt Glenna visited him and told the administration there that if they would free him, she would take responsibility over him and help him find meaningful work. She was able to convince them enough that they scheduled a parole hearing for him in February 1952. All he had to do was keep his nose clean for a few months. And then one month before that hearing, he was allegedly caught sexually assaulting another boy at knife point. There would be no going home with Aunt Glenna. Instead, he was sent to the Federal Reformatory in Petersburg, Virginia, where he quickly committed a further, quote, eight serious disciplinary offenses, three involving homosexual acts, end quote. They transferred him to a maximum security reformatory in Chillicothe, Ohio. And that, my friends, is Charlie Manson's childhood. So let's dive right in. His ancestors didn't paint me a very vivid picture, but as we get closer to Charlie, he has lineage from the famous Hatfields and McCoys, from the McCoy part of that fight. Getting ever closer to Charlie, we know his uncle Luther was a bit of a scallywag until after a prison stint when he suddenly found Jesus again. We know his father, the fake colonel, was a scoundrel who partied and, you know, sought out little girls who were barely on the other side of puberty to paw at and abandon. And maybe some others not super close to Charlie's particular branch of the tree, but that's the worst I've found. I don't think necessarily that Kathleen abused Charlie in any way, what time she was able to be his mother. In fact, most all sources, including Kathleen herself, said quite the opposite, that he was pampered heavily and loved by the whole family, save the cousin he came to live with. But before we get into the heavy stuff, I want to add another factor into this. Charlie grew up in, and nearly all of his recent ancestors lived in, a part of the United States that is kind of on the eastern foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. I pronounce it Appalachia. It's just where I'm from. The people that live there now, and especially back then, were no joke. His family, and certainly his mother, had been around for the Prohibition years. People would be up in the hills and mountains making moonshine. The Discovery Channel network has nearly made an industry on all of this. Or you had the other side of the coin. Right, The families who were staunchly religious, salt of the earth, workers who believed fast living and no praying got you a one-way ticket straight to hell. What I see is a girl who survived the Great Depression and was coming of age during Prohibition, being raised by loving Christian parents who were quite strict, believing that if Kathleen took the Bible seriously and walked the straight and narrow, she would be a good girl. As with some kids with parents like this, I think Kathleen rebelled. 
I think she saw her brother being Henri, which is one of my favorite words, and he was getting a kick out of it and having fun. I see a girl whose father and sister both died from pneumonia, which I'm sure was traumatic for her. So I see a girl who decided to live her life and enjoy it while she could. My opinion is that Kathleen was headstrong, bored, scared, unmotivated by menial things, and highly suggestible. And she saw a handsome man who was paying attention to her, talking to her in that oh so convincing way, stalking her like a predator, and she was hooked. I think she truly believed that Colonel would come back and get her and they'd be a family. Charlie would grow up to be an excellent liar himself who was eerily talented in talking to and influencing people around him. His antisocial father must have been quite the charmer and well, you have heard of Charles Manson, right? Do I think Kathleen had any kind of mental illness or personality disorder? Well, I'm not qualified to say. I'd love someone like Dr. Grande to take this on and give us his opinion. And again, we already know Charlie was officially diagnosed as having antisocial personality disorder with sociopathic traits. And we all know how this disorder displays. Disregard for right and wrong, persistent lying or deceit to exploit others, callousness, cynical and disrespectful to others, using charm to manipulate others for personal gain or personal pleasure, arrogance, sense of superiority, being extremely opinionated, recurring issues with breaking the law, lying, lack of impulse control, and on and on. His sociopathic personality and behavior is what made him able to charm, manipulate, and control those around him to do what he wanted. He was able to do this with no true remorse or emotion. Then some sources go on to say he was also diagnosed as having schizophrenia and paranoid delusional disorder. With schizophrenia, there would be delusions or false beliefs that are not based in reality. We see disorganized thinking and speech, hallucinations, extremely disorganized or abnormal motor behavior, which seems pretty apparent with Charlie. And finally, we have paranoid delusional disorder, which displays as intense, anxious, or fearful feelings and thoughts, often related to persecution, threat, or conspiracy. They have irrational or intense beliefs or suspicions that they feel they know to be true. And I agree with that. It's like he said... And then I went to the end of it, and then the old man would be ready to die, and he'd say, well, son, uh, sincerity is the best gimmick. Remember that. And I'd say, all right, be sincere. That's, that'll win it. He said, that's it. Sincerity and honesty, he said, it'll do it. It'll trick him every time. <laughs> I said, well, sincere and honesty, I never tried that. <laughs> I tried everything else, but maybe I'll try sincere and honesty. So then I looked in the book, and it says, the wages of sin is death. Now I figured, well, I don't want to die, so maybe I have been sinful here. Maybe I am wrong. Maybe I'll take a look at my life and say, well, I'm going to change it and start all over. You know, and I know I go to God and I say, hey, man, you're going to forgive me? And he's going to say, what do you do? You forgive you? I mean, what did you come to me for? Forgive yourself, man. Don't be bothering me. So tell me, guys, what do you think? Leave me a comment below. All of my contact information is also in the notes below. Please feel free to um, contact me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. And most of all, thank you so much for listening. If you want the part two of Charlie, the rest of the story, just let me know. I think we're pretty familiar with it. But if you want it, I'm happy to do it. Thank you so, so much for listening, guys. Have a great day. Charlie again said, Charlie again said, Charlie, Charlie would grow to be an excellent liar himself who, Charlie would grow,